Well, let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. And obviously, for those of us who understand this blessed day, I shall say happy Sabbath. And we are very grateful um, to have an opportunity to come together and to study God's word and to understand how the Bible, we've been learning all week, that the Bible, it does not just speak to our spiritual development, but it also speaks even to our mental and physical development. And the Lord has really impressed on my heart to say this, that, you know, these meetings that we have set up beginning last Sunday, all the way up until now, continuing tomorrow, and for the next two weeks, these meetings were put together specifically that the great message that God has given to this body of believers as Seventh-day Adventists would be given to those who know it not. And I want to say that I am very grateful for those of you who are not part of the Seventh-day Adventist community that have been coming uh, night after night. You've been hearing, you've been learning, and I know that the Lord has been blessing you. And I'm just very grateful, and we have just begun, because there's even more in store. And I want to say to my brothers and sisters that are part of this household of faith, that the Lord needs more from you. I want to make that very clear. The Lord needs more from you. Um, I want to say that to those who are viewing on these cameras, especially those of you who are local. Uh, these meetings were not put together so you can find a comfortable, convenient way to sit in your living room and hear messages. That's not what this meeting was put on for. This meeting was put on so you can leave your house, get out of your comfort zone, and come to the meeting but bring precious souls who do not know this message that they may come and hear the word of God. And so therefore, I'm going to ask all of us that if we can really just be a bit more sacrificial in our mindsets of understanding these meetings are really not for you only, but they're for your friends, your coworkers, your family members, and all these people that you know that do not know this precious message which makes up this everlasting gospel. And I want to encourage you to please Plead with God, if necessary, to get you out of your comfort zone and realize that these meetings are not put on just so you can come and say amen, but they have been put together so that you can think about who is it that I know that does not know these things. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if next week or the week after that, we all go back to work and busyness of life and you find out one of your coworkers have to get their feet or legs amputated because of the complications of diabetes, and here it is that you knew these wonderful tr truths and you could have shared it with them. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if that would have happened? Wouldn't it be a tragedy to hear about a friend or a relative or someone who has passed away because of the complications with hypertension, that silent killer or otherwise, and who knows, maybe God wanted to use you so that you can be an instrument to tell somebody so maybe they could have been spared from that fate and had their probation extended a little longer. I beg of you, please get out of your comfort zone. Please understand this, this is not just for you to come and say amen. This is not for just for you to sit home and to sit in your couches and just simply listen and enjoy it. It is so that we can be part of God's team to go forward and finish his work. And I pray that that burden will be so deep on your heart that you'll be uncomfortable coming to the meeting by yourself, but that you'll realize God has given me something to give to others. Because tonight is also another very special message, something very important that so many people need to hear. And my hope and my prayer is that God will put that burden on your heart as I know he's put it on my heart. And that we will do all that we can to give the invitation that others may come and see. As we prepare our hearts to receive the message tonight, diet and the mind, I would like to invite as much of you as are able to. Let us kneel together and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing us to make it safely through another week. We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to worship you and to learn of you, to study your words of truth, and that by beholding Jesus, we can become changed into the same image. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for the way that sometimes we can be so focused on ourselves and what we need and what we want 
that we forget the great need of humanity at large. The world needs a revelation of Jesus Christ. The world is sick and sinful, and you have given us the solution to give to the world. Please forgive us for taking our eyes off of our focus. And I pray help us once again. Put the burden in our hearts. We don't have it naturally, Father. But I'm grateful that your love for souls is still very much alive. And if we have your presence within us through your Holy Spirit, we can have the same burden you have. And do that miracle, I pray, even tonight. May you truly take our lives and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. May you speak to our minds and speak to our hearts and open our eyes and give us an understanding of your precious and present truths for these times. And I thank you that you have heard this prayer, for we do ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to know how many of us are, uh, how many of us are visiting with us tonight? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist, but somebody invited you and you're visiting with us. Could you raise your hand, please? We just want to acknowledge you in the room. Praise the Lord. God bless you. All right. And there's going to be a special gift that we'd like to give to you. And uh, this gift, we'll give it to you at the conclusion of our service. But uh, that gift is none other than a book called The Ministry of Healing. And you're going to find that the book, The Ministry of Healing, is a wonderful book. It, it's a beautiful commentary of the life of Jesus and how he walked on this earth and ministered to so many people. Did you know that Jesus did more healing than he did preaching and teaching? And Jesus understood that the more that he was the helping hands of God to precious souls who were hurting and sick and suffering, that as Christ was ministering to them, it automatically caused an open-mindedness of the individual, the recipient of the blessing, that they would be willing to follow Christ wheresoever he would lead. Jesus was a master evangelist. He knew how to win people to his heart, and he knew that it would not just come through preaching and proclaiming a lot of amazing statements. Jesus had to touch people. Jesus had to sit down with people for sometimes two, three, four, five hours. And he would have to talk with them and listen to them and share with them and strengthen them and build them up. It is that very book that I am so thankful that I will have the privilege of making sure you have put in your hand tonight uh, for those who are visiting with us. And you will find that in this book, Ministry of Healing, there's a wonderful statement that I believe is very important to understand as we're looking at the subject of diet and the mind. There's a statement right from this book, Ministry of Healing, if we can have the screen come up, and it states this, disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly aggravated by what? The imagination. It says, many are lifelong invalids who might be well if they only thought so. Many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness, and the evil effect is produced because it is what? Think about that. The evil is literally produced because it is what? Expected. Literally, if a person expects a certain fate and dwells upon it enough, it actually can become a reality. It goes on to say, many die from disease, the cause of which is wholly imaginary. You see, all this week we've been talking about hypertension, diabetes, we've been talking about various forms of arthritis, but let me tell you something, you would be amazed at how much disease, whether it be cancer or otherwise, you would be amazed at how many diseases literally start in our minds. Once an individual can get to a point where they begin to worry so much, be concerned so much, and have such expectations, it can literally produce disease in our systems. And it's not just from this little book here that's a commentary upon different biblical principles, but it's even in medical science. Did you ever hear of the placebo? There's something that is called the placebo effect. It is very well known in the medical world to date. And you will find that the placebo effect, this is how it works. What it shows us is this. I'm going to show you a quotation from WebMD, which gives us a lot of, you know, up-to-date scientific information, if you will. And it says this. A placebo is anything that seems to be a real medical treatment but isn't. It goes on to say it could be a pill, a shot, or some other type of fake treatment. 
What all placebos have in common is that they do not contain an active substance meant to affect health. So what would happen is there were physicians, lots and lots of physicians, and what they would do is they would get people together with whatever the ailment may be, and they would take the pill, which in this case we'll call the placebo, and what they would do is demonstrate this placebo effect. The pill would sometimes just have water or maybe sugar in it. That's it. Nothing else, nothing nutritive, nothing with any healing virtue of any kind. And they would tell people, listen, we have found something that can help you get better from your ailment. And then people would actually take this sugar or water pill. And then do you know, in a period of sometimes hours or days, individuals would start saying, you know what? I feel so much better. And they started, I feel so much better. And, and, and when they would do their blood work, they actually were better. In other words, there is so much power in the mind, ladies and gentlemen, that depending on the focus of the mind, it can literally bring us down a path of healing or a path of sickness. Now watch this. It goes on to say research on the placebo effect has focused on the relationship of mind and body. One of the most common theories is that the placebo effect is due to a person's what? Isn't that something? That's almost like coming right out of Ministry of Healing. It literally says that a person, the, the placebo effect is due to a person's expectation. If a person expects a pill to do something, then it's possible that the body's own chemistry can cause effects similar to what a medication might have caused. That's how powerful the mind is. And the reason why this becomes very important is because we're living in the day and age of depression. We're living in the day and age of bipolar. We're living in the day and age where people go through all sorts of mental challenges. And here it is that we're studying right now that we're seeing that a lot of disease is wholly imaginary. It's what's going on in your head. And I'll give you, you know, and I, I, I have lived this, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something. I, I literally, literally travel the planet Earth. I mean, I, don't, I have lost count of how many countries I've been in by now and all the countries and all the states throughout the United States. And it's amazing. When you travel so much and you do a lot, sometimes you're exposed to so much germs and all sorts of things and airplanes. I always call an airplane my second home. And sometimes you're exposed to so much that if you're not careful, your immune system can get suppressed because of the fact that you're moving from one time zone to another, and then sometimes you're not able to do a nice detox as you normally would if you had a more regulated lifestyle. So I remember just a week or so ago, my family and I were in Yonkers, New York, and we were training missionaries. We were training approximately 50 missionaries, and literally I started to feel like a cold was coming on. Started to feel it. I said, you know, I know my body very well. And I started feeling it. I said, you know what? I can tell a cold is starting to come on. And all I had to do was surrender in my thoughts and, sit and just tell my wife, honey, I'm sick. And it, once I say that, it's like it triggers in my brain and I start going down this down spiral. And before you know it, I'm going to be in the bed and I'm going to be laid out for a couple of days before I can recuperate. And I had no time for that because I had to train these missionaries. So therefore, I literally had to focus my mind and focus on something which is a beautiful chapter in that book, Ministry of Healing, called Mind Cure. And I began to think very positively. I began to stay focused. I began to pray, and I began to go ahead and hydrate and do all the things that God has taught in the natural remedy world. And I'm telling you the truth. Within about two days of feeling that way, all of a sudden, my energy was back. My strength was back. And whatever was trying to get me, got, got. In other words, I am living proof, and perhaps some of you in this room are living proof, that sometimes, depending on where the mind is focused, it can begin to trigger and bring on certain things in our system that can take us either down or up. Now, God himself is very much into our minds. And if you don't believe so, then what you need to do is behold scripture. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, the 26th chapter and the third verse, the Bible says, thou will keep him in what kind of peace? It says perfect peace whose mind is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's one of the problems that many of us have. 
One of the reasons why we suffer with so much depression, one of the reasons why we suffer with so many of the challenges that start in the mind is because we put our mind on occasions on the Lord, but it's not stayed on him. And if you have occasional contacts with the Lord, then you're going to have occasional health and you're going to have occasional peace. And in a period of time, you're going to end up having no peace at all. God says, I can keep your mind in perfect peace. God says, I can give you total, complete peace to the point that it literally passes all understanding. But the only way that can happen is the mind has to be stayed on me. If your mind one minute is on the blessed hymns, but the next minute it's on the latest hip hop song. That is not a mind that is being stayed on him. If one minute our minds are in the Bible and the next minute our minds is on desperate housewives. That is not a mind being stayed on God. And as a result of that, because we have a double mind, the Bible says we are unstable in all our ways. So God literally says, listen, I want your mind. God says, I can do amazing things with the mind. I can even give you peace that passes all understanding and relieve every single ounce of stress in your life. But your mind has to be stayed on God. God goes on to tell us in the book of Romans, the 12th chapter, he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is the reason for this? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God says, I want to transform your mind. God wants our mind so bad that he actually spelled it out in Proverbs 23, 26. He says, my son, give me thine heart. But the word heart in the Hebrew means mind. And let thine eyes observe my ways. This is what God has always wanted. He wants your mind. Because he knows once the mind is connected with God, then the mind can stay focused. The mind can have peace. We can understand the perfect will of God. How many times have you asked God questions? Lord, what are you doing with my life? Lord, why are these things happening? In other words, we are literally saying things to God that proves we don't know nor understand nor accept his will. But with a transformed mind, we are told that we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you know you can prove it? You don't have to be in the state of perplexity and confusion that a lot of us are in in these very last moments of Earth's history. Even some of God's appointed delegates, some of his messengers, those who have received the present truth for this time are just as depressed as the world. And we can't help nobody like that, saints. So therefore, God says, listen, I want your mind. I want you to learn how to stay focused. I want you to understand that there's something special that he put in us when we do a simple little study of physiology. You see, when God made that thing, that organ called the brain, when God made it, he had something that I want you to notice. He had something here in the front called the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is very, very precious. It's very, very special. And you will find that when God would say, be transformed in the renewing of your mind, when he would say, you keep your mind stayed on me, perfect peace, the God who would say, my son, give me thine heart, you will find that what he wants us to do is he wants us to understand we have something called a frontal lobe. And that frontal lobe is very important, saints, because you will notice that here is what the frontal lobe does. The executive functions of the frontal lobes involve the ability to recognize future consequences resulting from current actions. Is that a good thing? Well, that's a very important thing. How, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful, parents, if we can instill this in our children, that we can help our children recognize future consequences resulting from current actions? Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if we can solidify that in the minds of our children? We'd have a whole different generation of youth. But not only that, it goes on to say to choose between good and bad actions. Do you understand why God wants the mind? God says, I want your mind because it is your mind. It is that frontal lobe. That's what you're using to make choices whether you're going to follow me or follow Satan. So literally, God says, I want your mind. Now watch. It says to choose between good and bad actions or better and best override and suppress socially unacceptable responses and determine similarities and differences between things or events. All of this are connected to the functions of what is called the frontal lobe. 
And therefore, what we have to do is we have to do everything possible to keep our frontal lobe in a very healthy state. We have to keep our frontal lobe in a very strong state so that way our minds can always be stayed on God and we can receive all the benefits from perfect peace, proving what is that perfect and acceptable will of God and being able to give God our minds so that as he has it, we can become like him. It is imperative that we take care of this frontal lobe. Is that right? Now, the question is how? How could we do it? What are some ways that we can do it? Did you know that the Bible does not leave us aloof? Did you know that the Bible actually shows us through the example of Jesus Christ, one of the key ways that he was able to keep his mind stayed on God? Now, please understand I said one of the. In other words, I am not minimizing what we're talking about tonight to the only thing. But this is one of the key things that actually kept Christ so focused on his father that he always chose to follow his father rather than follow the influences of Satan. Notice again the function of the frontal lobe. It is to help us choose between good and bad actions. Did you know how Christ chose between good and bad actions or what actually assisted him? Observe. Did you know that the Bible gives us a text of scripture that you and I would do well to consider? And I want you to think about this. There's a passage of scripture that I am sure if any of you are church going people, Bible students or anything like that, you more than likely have read this verse of scripture at some point in your life. Notice what the verse says. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. How many of you have read this verse before? You've read this verse before, haven't you? You've heard this verse several times, I would imagine. This is a clear text where we learn that Emmanuel is none other than God with us. This was talking about Jesus in Matthew 1 and verse 23. So here it is that this is the passage of scripture that is very familiar. But what's many a times unfamiliar to us is the next verse. You see, the next verse says this. Talking about Emmanuel, watch this. It says this. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now that part of scripture, many of us are not familiar with. Did you know that part of the reason why Christ was able to choose good and refuse evil was because of the diet he had? Tonight's subject, diet and the mind. Jesus was given a diet in his day. You remember? You remember? And keep in mind, butter and honey in those days, that was considered a very, very good, uh, high-level type of, of dietary practice. And you know how I know that? Because what did God, remember when God talked about Canaan land? And he told the children of Israel, when you leave Egypt, you're going to go through the wilderness and go in Canaan land. What did God say Canaan land would be filled with? A land flowing with? Milk and honey. Did you know butter comes, you know, milk and butter, same thing. Milk and honey, butter and honey. Literally, that same wonderful diet, that was a diet in those days. You see, those of us who were here opening night, we studied that in the last days, the animal kingdom is going to become so diseased that we cannot partake of these type of products like the dairy and all these things. But the Bible shows in those days, butter and honey shall he eat. And it was of such a diet that it literally helped him, assisted him in knowing how to refuse evil and choose good. You know what that teaches us then? That means that diet plays a role in the strengthening of the mind, yea, the frontal lobe. And this is why God says so much in his word on the point of diet. This is the reason why. Now, Let's go ahead and let's take a notice here. Did you know May 24th, just this year, the Washington Post, I love it because, you know, medical science is late, but thank God, not too late. But you will notice that they're figuring some things out. And here's one of the things they figured out. In the Washington Post, May 24th, 2014, notice what they had in the article. Can what you eat affect your mental health? It says, new research links diet and the mind. Can you imagine it's new, 2014? told you they're late. Late. But thank God not too late. So here it is. They say, hey, you know, we think we're discovering something. Yeah, God knew it all along. God knew it all along. That's why I'm telling you. We have to learn to give the credit to the one who made it. And God knew these things all along. Now watch this. 
It goes on in the article to say, research exploring the link between diet and mental health is a very new field. The first papers only came out a few years ago, said Michael Burke, a professor of psychiatry at the Deakin University School of Medicine in Australia. But the results are unusually consistent, and they show a link between diet quality, diet quality and mental health. The common element seems to be whole, unprocessed, nutrient-dense foods. Have we been talking about whole foods this week? We've been talking about these things, have we not? Talking about nutrient-dense foods? We've been talking about these things this week. Medical science is just figuring this out, but God says I had it written through inspiration many, many years ago. It's just we missed it. It wasn't the focus of many ministers. It wasn't the focus. And this is why sometimes health has been minimized to some little nugget that can just be given on a weekend. And here it is that health, brothers, if we understood how imperative health is to mental development, we would put health on a much, much higher level. We wouldn't limit it to one or two times in a year that we give an emphasis and invite people to come out and talk about it. It would be a regular part of the church service and church functions. We would understand, man, we have found a piece of gold that we must give to those who know it not. And this is why we're talking about diet and the mind. So therefore, what we have to start looking at now is governing principles when it comes to our eating and drinking. The reason why is because now we understand what's going on. Number one, many diseases taking place in our world today are wholly imaginary, things that's going on in the mind. So if we really want to overcome many of our diseases, we're going to have to help strengthen the mind. Well, God says, well, there's ways to do that. If you keep your mind stayed on me, he says you will have perfect peace. If you allow me to renew your mind, he says you will be able to prove and know the acceptable and perfect will of God. God says, my son, give me your mind. Let me educate it. Let me train it. So we said, all right, I'm willing to do that. But practically, how? One of the ways outside of choice, God says, I want you to start paying better attention to what you're putting in your system. God says, I want you to start paying better attention of what you're eating and what you're drinking and what you're putting in your body because now we understand that there is a direct connection between diet and the condition of the mind. If you're following thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. So now the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, which was our text of scripture for the opening, it states, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, there are many ways to understand this verse. The Apostle Paul was actually counseling people, fellow brothers, fellow Jews. He was actually counseling them and telling them, listen, if somebody serves you some food that may have been offered to an idol, he says, look, don't go around when they serve you the food. Don't go around asking them, listen, was this offered to an idol? He says, don't even bring that up. Literally, you read that in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, don't bring those things up. If they lay it before you, go ahead and eat it. But if they tell you, hey, this has been offered to an idol, go ahead and have a piece of it, then he says, then go ahead and say, well, thank you, but no thank you. Now, when he said this, he was saying, the reason I'm giving you this counsel is because our goal is to win people to Jesus. So the context of this verse, when he says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, the context of the glory of God was that whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, keep in mind the goal of glorifying God, making him known, and drawing the people to his heart. That's the context of it. Are you following? But then there's something called applications. And applications is when you can now get broad and you can get wide with scripture. And therefore, we're going to consider the glorification of God on another level as we now consider Exodus, the 33rd chapter. And we're going to entertain the question, what is the glory of God? Let's really talk about what is the glory of God in essence? What is the glory of God at the end of the day? Notice what the Bible says. In Exodus 33 and verse 18, Moses is dialoguing with the Lord, and Moses says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So notice Moses wants to see the glory of God. Keep in mind, what you eat or what you drink, we want to do it to the glory of God. So we're going to make an application now. So notice, Moses wants to see the glory of God. Verse 19, God responds to Moses by saying this. I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 
So notice there's a conversation going on. Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God responds by saying, I'll show you my goodness and I'll proclaim my name. So one of the first things we need to understand is that they're having a conversation. That's like me going to my buddy, Brother Bliss, and I say, Bliss, do me a favor, show me your car. Bliss says, no problem, I'll show you my Toyota. Are we talking about the same thing? Did we use different verbiage? Yes. So notice, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. But then God responds by saying, I'll show you my goodness and proclaim my name. So what's the first thing that we learn? The glory of God, the goodness of God, the name of God are synonymous. They're having a conversation. Did God show Moses his glory? Yes, he did. Notice where he did it. He did it in Exodus, the 34th chapter. And notice what he showed Moses, and you tell me what he saw. It says in Exodus 34, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. What did God show Moses? His character. So the glory of God is God's so when the Bible says, whether therefore you eat or whether therefore you drink or whatsoever you do, do to the glory of God, whatever I eat or whatever I drink, it should help reproduce God's character in me. You following? Now watch this. So therefore, we now go ahead and ask the question, since the glory of God is his character, how do we eat and drink to it practically? How do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and let's notice what the text shows us. Number one, we're going to consider, we can observe some attributes of God's character. Now, in Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20, you will notice that the Bible says something very powerful, and why don't we go ahead and turn there. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, we're going to consider verses 19 and 20, and let's notice what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. When you get there, please let me know by saying amen. All right. Deuteronomy 30, and we're looking at verses 19 and 20. And so the Bible says this, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose what? Choose life. It says, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is what? For he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So according to Deuteronomy 30, in verse 19, God says, I present before you life and death, blessings and cursings. But what is he encouraging to choose? Choose life. And then notice who is life in verse 20. God himself. So when he was saying choose life, he was saying choose me. Very good. So when you think about God, an attribute of the character of God is that he is life. Very good. John 14 and verse 6. You probably know that text very well. You may not even need to turn to it. Jesus one day was talking to the disciples and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So again, Christ is referring to himself as life. John 11 and verse 25, maybe you know it, maybe not. This is when Jesus was talking about the resurrection shortly after Lazarus' experience. And he says in John 11 and verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. So over and over and over again, an attribute of the character of God is that he is life. So whatsoever you eat or whatever you drink, it should reproduce life in you, not death. This is how we start to make it practical now. This is now how I can apply this to grocery shopping. I can literally start saying, all right, and when I go grocery shopping, I'm going to think about what I'm going to put in my cart. And whatever does not put life in me, I don't want it in my cart. 
because I got to make sure that whatever I'm eating is going to have a direct positive effect upon the condition of my mind. You understand? So considering that, now what we're going to talk about is what you eat and drink. We're going to talk about that. What should you eat and drink then? Well, before I tell you what to eat and drink, I think it would be wise to tell you what not to eat and drink. So why don't we start there? This is what not to eat and drink or not to drink. These are the drinks that you don't want to have. Now, one of the key ingredients in these things is none other than high fructose corn syrup. You know, these empty calorie sugars, these poisonous sugars. That, it's amazing. While refined sugars give no nutrients, did you know that it requires nutrients to be metabolized? So in other words, when you drink something like Sprite, Mountain Dew, Coca-Cola, or any of these types of stuff, when you and I drink these things down, did you know that it literally takes your B vitamins to actually metabolize these empty calorie sugars? Does anybody know what's the purpose of your B vitamins? It's to make sure you have a healthy nervous system. So when you and I, literally, I always tell people, sugar is wanted for stealing. Because it literally steals your B vitamins. It gives you no nutrients of any kind, but it steals your B vitamins. Then it also depletes your immune system. Your immune system is God's natural army that he put inside of your body to literally keep away sickness and disease. And when we take in these poisons in our system, it's literally debilitating our immune system. Now go to Psalms 46 and let me show you something. Psalms 46. Watch this. I'm, I'm literally showing you how you can take biblical principles and practice it in daily dietary choices. In Psalms, the 46th division, notice what the Bible says. Psalms 46, and we're just going to look at verse 1. Because we've learned that the glory of God is God's character. Well, let me show you something else about God's character. In John 40, I'm sorry, Psalms 46 in verse 1, if you're there, just say amen. amen. In Psalms 46 in verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So notice that God refers to himself in Psalms 46, 1 as our strength. Now, if you and I are going to literally drink something that's going to weaken our immune system and not strengthen it, is that too the glory of God? No, it is not. So that stuff needs to go back on the shelf and out of our cards. You understand? Now, we can go ahead and continue. Alcoholic beverages. Again, this does not fit in the chapter. And again, it's not about small or great, this whole ideology of moderation. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing we are to eat moderately or drink moderately are things that God called good. Can I prove it? Go to Proverbs 24. Literally, Proverbs 24. Watch this. Proverbs, the 24th chapter. In Proverbs 24, the only things that we should eat or drink moderately are the things that God calls good. Notice Proverbs, the 24th chapter. In Proverbs 24 and verse 13, notice the principle. Proverbs 24 and verse 13, it says, My son, do what? Eat thou honey. Why? Because it is good. So notice that God says, my son, eat thou honey because it is good and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. So remember, we're not vegans. Is that right? Because we know vegans don't mess with honey, but God says, go ahead and eat it because it's good. But then watch this. Proverbs 25, 16. Notice what it says. Even though honey is good, notice what God says about this good product. It says in Proverbs 25 and verse 16, hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is what? sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit. So notice, God says, eat the honey because it is good, but the only amount we should eat is that which is sufficient. That's moderation. This is biblical moderation. God never calls something bad and says, but have a little of it. The only things God says that we can take or ingest in moderation is that which he has called good. Now, last I checked, when I read Proverbs 20, God says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So I don't want to take anything in my system that causes me to mock, be raging, or be deceived. I don't want to put anything like that, and I believe any intelligent person in this room would not want to do it either. So therefore, alcohol does not fit drinking to the glory of God. But do you know what? Neither does coffee. 
Neither does coffee. And you know what I should add to this? Neither does coffee and neither does tea. And when I say tea, I am talking about your black tea. I'm talking about your green tea, which is in the great number of our cereals, especially that organization called Cashi. Tons and tons of green tea that they put inside of their products. Now, why? Because green tea almost has more caffeine than coffee. So the very reasons why we're avoiding the coffee, yet taking on the green tea, but the green tea has high levels of caffeine as well. So if you're going to get out of, get the coffee out of your system, and if you're going to get the black Lipton teas and these things out of your system, you definitely might as well get green tea out of your system because they're all in the same caffeinated family. Now, herbal teas is a whole different ballgame. Herbal teas are quite fine. Your chamomile, your peppermint, these type of things, those things you don't have to worry about. And somebody says, but what about decaf? Decaf does not mean no calf. It just means low calf. So don't get caught up into the lies. It's kind of like the whole enrichment program. You know, we're enriched products. And we learned that the enrichment product, the enrichment program is a joke. All they did was take a grain, strip it, of all of its various minerals and then put just a small amount back and have the nerve to call it enriched. It's not really enriched. It's stripped. It's the same idea with decaf. Decaf does not mean no cap. It just means low cap. Another way to say it, it doesn't mean lots of poison. It just means less poison. So why would we want to put that in our system? You understand? So that is, this is not drinking to the glory of God. It affects the function of our cells. It beclouds the intellect, benumbs the energies, excites the nervous system, and then later depresses and exhausts the body. These are not the things that you want to put in your system. So what is it that you want to put in your system? Number one, water. The drink we hate to drink. Water. We learned... We are supposed to get on that scale, and whatever that number is that comes up, whether we like it or not, we ought to take that number and cut it in half, and that's how many fluid ounces we should be drinking in a day. And you'd be amazed. I can almost guarantee you, if anybody in this room is a tea drinker or a juice drinker, there is a good chance that you don't get the sufficient amount of water you're supposed to get, because it's hard to share. When we look at how much water we should be consuming in one day, it's very difficult for us sometimes to fit the other juices and the other drinks in the picture. So one of the first things we need to do is get on your water. That is definitely to the glory of God. Water is so beautiful that Jesus equated himself to it. He spoke to that woman at the well in John 4, and he says that, you think this water is good for you? He says, listen, I have waters of life that will spring up inside you, eternal life. Jesus literally referred to himself as water. So therefore, water is something we should be putting in our system. If we're going to drink juice, we need to drink it at appropriate times, and we should be drinking juice that is fresh. We should be drinking juice without all these additives. Remember, we studied about additives the other night. You want to make sure it is as fresh and pure. If you're drinking apple juice, let the only ingredient be apple juice. When you got 15 other ingredients in it, ladies and gentlemen, you got 15 other question marks that you're putting inside your system. We're the only general, man, I tell you, it's amazing. We will go ahead and we will look at ingredients and we can't even pronounce them, but yet we'll go ahead and eat it and drink it anyhow. We gamble with our bodies. We won't gamble with our bank accounts, but we'll gamble with our bodies all the time. We have to start putting a higher level as it relates to God's call to take care of his temples, our bodies. So therefore, these things are definitely not drinking to the glory of God. Water, drinking to the glory of God. The fresh juices without all these additives and extra sugars, those are definitely drinking to the glory of God. Your good herbal teas, these are drinking to the glory of God. But all of these other things here, no, ladies and gentlemen, we want to eliminate these, not minimize it, eliminate it, because it's not to the glory of God. Now, food. The first phase of food that we do have to pay attention to is what the Bible speaks clearly on. These are things that are called unclean. It's almost, it's almost interesting that we call it unclean food. It's really not food. We only call it that because people are eating it. But nevertheless, these are what's called unclean animals. These are things that God says, they shall be even an abomination unto you. Please understand, a pig in and of itself is not an abomination. Did you know that? A pig is not unclean 
just by itself. You read Romans 14, 14, it talks about that. No animal is unclean of itself, but God says, but it's unclean to you because he says, you're my people. So God says, I esteem it unclean to you. And therefore, God says, we shouldn't take it if we consider ourselves children of God. So if we are consuming all sorts of things, I grew up in a home where we ate whatever moved. Whatever would move, we would find some way to get it on our plate. So therefore, we would go ahead and eat these things. And I grew up, I'm telling you, I feel like sometimes this, I'm a walking miracle thinking about how much garbage. I mean, I could disgust you with some of the things that we ate. Literally, my father used to feed me crabs right there. Where is it? Yeah, right there, crabs. We used to eat that all the time, seafood. I was a big time seafood lover. And I remember we used to flip the crab open on the back and I see all this yellow gooky stuff. And my father and I, my, literally, I would take it and I would just go, and I'll just suck it in. And I'll just say, oh, dad, this tastes so good. And I said, dad, what is it? And then he would say, it's crab poop. And I said, you joking. And I'll just go ahead and keep eating it anyhow. And do you know it was years later <laughs> that I discovered it was crab poop. You never saw a man move so quick to get a detox. I wanted to get cleaned out from head to toe. I said, I can't believe that I've eaten an animal's feces and called it food. But that's what a lot of people eat when they eat the shrimp, when they go to Red Lobster and all these places, and there's that little brown line right in the back of the shrimp. They just think, oh, well, we'll just cover it with some cocktail sauce. But they are, they are literally eating a shrimp's fecal matter. So these things, it is a terrible, these things are such artery-clogging foods, especially the seafood, the shellfish. The body doesn't digest these things very well at all. So therefore, God says the pork, the rabbit, the duck, all the web-footed birds, birds of prey, the snails and the frogs and the clams and the oysters and the eels and all these things, all your various seafood, shellfish, God says, this is not for my people. It might be for others who have no government over their bodies, but this for my people who are called to be temperate, God says, that is not for you. It is to be esteemed an abomination and unclean. So therefore, God makes it clear, this is not what I want my people to be consuming. And this is consistent because, you know, sometimes people read the Bible and they think that God cleans animals. I never read anything where God cleans animals. I read in 1 John 1, 7 that the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins. I never read where it says it cleans animals. So the same pig that was back in those days that was considered unclean is the same pig today that the Bible still declares is unclean. And God does not want us to eat these things. And now, if you don't want to hear Jesus, listen to Barabbas. The world will tell you of how filthy and unclean and literally how horrible it is to consume things like shellfish and pigs. They're scavengers, ladies and gentlemen. They eat garbage for a living. Why in the world would anybody want to put these things inside of their system? These are the scavengers. So therefore, we don't want to participate of these things. Amen? Now, after that, well, somebody says, well, you know, but what about my hamburger, my goat, and my beef, and my chicken, and my fish? What about it? Well, let's find out about it. Let's notice what the Bible says. You see, a time came when mankind began to consume flesh. And as a result of consuming flesh, God said, all right, well, he says, I'm going to let man eat clean animals. And I'm going I'm to show you why God allowed man to eat clean animals. But God said, I'm going to let man eat clean animals. And he would say, you know, have to have the cloven hoof and it has to chew the cud, you know, eat the grass, chew it up, vomit it back out and eat it again. God says, those were the kind of animals. He says, I'll let you go ahead and do that. And he gave some rules. But watch this. He gave some rules that a lot of people are not following today, not even some people that's uh, in the movement. And notice, in Genesis 9, 3 and 4, when God permitted man to eat the clean animals. Did you know that God gave some rules that today many individuals are not following? And as a result of that, sickness and disease and death is running rampant throughout our various communities. Notice, the Bible says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the what? Life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Now, God made that clear. He says, listen, if you're going to eat the animal, the clean animal, he says, all the blood has to be removed. Now, you know what I like about this? This is Genesis 9. And do you know what's the reality in Genesis 9? Even Abraham wasn't born yet. What is Abraham considered the father of? 
Well, outside of the father of faith, he's also the father of what group of people? He's the father of the Jews or the father of the Israelites. Notice that Abraham was not born yet. So you know what that means? That means that this instruction was given before there was ever Jewish people. I like that point. Because sometimes people say, oh, that's a Jewish law. Well, how could this be a Jewish law? There were no Jews yet. You understand? No Jewish people. These were Gentiles. And God said to Gentiles, non-Jews, he says, if you're going to eat the clean animal, God says, I don't want you to eat it with the blood. Now, another rule that was stated during the time of the Jewish dispensation, but was applicable in the days of Noah, was not only that they were not supposed to eat blood, they were also not supposed to eat fat. Notice, the Bible says in Leviticus 3 and verse 17, it shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. So when God didn't want the fat, the blood to be consumed, equivalent to that, he says, I did not want the fat to be consumed. And this is why when you read the books today that are talking so much about health and the importance of a plant-based diet and getting off of the flesh and all these different things, God already knew these things. He had it written. He had it recorded. But what happened was men have a tendency to steal. And they're stealing credit. That belongs to God. So we look at certain men today and we call them geniuses. And here it is. God says, I was the original genius. God says, I knew these things all along and I had it recorded. And you know what God also says? And we got to take it. We got to take our licks, saints. God says, shame on my people. Because he says, my people who knew my word should have been teaching this and making this very, very plain. And now what's happening is it looks like worldlings and new agers are ahead of even the children of the Most High God. That ought not be. So therefore, he needs to get his credit back. So therefore, when we think about this, this is it. Now, I showed you God says no blood, and that was before there were Jews. Now, some would say, so then are you saying that if I eat animals with the blood still mingled in it, that uh, it is unadvisable or unhealthy? No, I'm going to go further than that. Notice what the Bible actually calls it. This recording is in 1 Samuel 14, verses 32 and 33. What happened here is that uh, King Saul was actually causing his people to fight against the enemy nations. And what King Saul did is he had them fast, and then they fasted, and then they fought. Now, is it wise to fight against someone else and exert all that physical energy when you're fasting? It's not wise to do that. You're going to be starving, you're going to be famished, you're going to be weak. Well, what happened was after the children of Israel be began to have some level of success against the Philistines, it got to a point in time that it was time to eat. And notice what the Bible says took place as a result of them being so hungry. It says, and the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground and the people did eat them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people, what? Sin against the Lord in that they eat with the blood. So when individuals eat the animal with the blood still mingled in its meat, is it simply unadvisable and a bad health practice, or is it what the Bible calls sin? It is a sin. That gives you a whole brand new attitude when you think about a Whopper. When you think about a Big Mac, when you think about Chicken McNuggets, when you think about all of these different things that we get from these fast food uh, restaurants and subways, and we make those little turkey sandwiches and all those things, and we wonder, what's that pink hue in that turkey meat? What is it when, I'm buy, when I buy that fried chicken, I take a bite in that chicken, and as I take the bite, I see the veins inside, and I see the pinkness all throughout the meat. And sometimes if I see the bone, I actually see nice little blood spots all on the bone. That's the life of the animal. And listen, saints, disease flows through blood. And this is the key reason why God would say, I don't want my people eating the animal with the blood in it. So quite honestly, if we were to be honest with ourselves, then we would have to say the only meat, if an individual was to insist, I insist on eating my meat. I love my chicken. I'm going to die by my chicken. If somebody has that kind of attitude, then what you should at least do to be more consistent with the creator whom we at least profess to serve or desire to serve 
we should be eating what's called kosherized meat, which means we're going to have to go ahead and find some of these Jewish establishments or otherwise, and we're going to have to have them go ahead and serve us chicken where they have gone through the process of extracting all the blood. The only problem is, is keep in mind, saints, that, you know, when you eat it, you might think somebody put your belt on the plate. Because a lot of times when you eat the chicken without the blood, it has a taste to it that almost tastes like leather. In other words, a lot of the flavor that is in the animal comes from the blood. It's coming from the blood. And God says, I don't want my people eating these things. And you'll be amazed at how much blood and pus is in milk. 2% and otherwise. Blood and pus literally flowing through milk. Those books that I referenced uh, yesterday when we talked about milk, you should study those things. We're living in a time where not just the animals, but the products of the animals have become deeply and grossly poisoned. Do you know how much blood is found in egg yolk? I mean, these are serious things. And as a result of that, we're wondering, why, why is it that I'm a vegetarian? Why is it that I'm lacto-ovo and I'm still getting sick, just like the person who's eating meat? We're wondering why, but listen, saints, I'm just telling you, we are living in that phase of Earth's history where these things are getting more poison. And if God has given us options that we can eat things that can put life in us to strengthen our minds, we need to start choosing life. Well, let's go on. Somebody says, but Brother Lemon, listen, man, you're quoting all these Old Testament Verses. Don't you know I'm a New Testament Christian? That's what people say sometimes. I'm a New Testament Christian. Now, if you give me all these Old Testament verses, where is it in the New Testament? I got it right here. Acts 15. In Acts, the 15th chapter, verses 19 and 20. Literally, what happened here is uh, the, the Judaizers, the Jewish brothers who were leaving Judaism and coming into Christianity, they wanted to carry some of the laws of Moses with them, the ceremonial sacrifices and all these other things. So they were trying to impress these laws of Moses that were nailed to the cross, and they were trying to impress these upon the new believing Gentiles. It got so bad and created so much confusion that the brethren had to come together in a general conference session. And when they came together, they began to lay out rules as it relates to what the new believing Gentiles should follow as well as what they shouldn't. Notice what the ruling was. The Bible says, wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, talking about the new believers, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. It's consistent. Before there were Jews, no blood. During the Jews, no blood. After the Jewish dispensation, Christian dispensation, no blood. Now we have to understand a very important principle in John the third chapter. Let's go to John three. You need to, you need to understand this right here, right now. So let's go to John three and let's notice what the Bible says in John three. And we're going to consider verse 19. In John 3 and verse 19, I want you to notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, just say amen. In John 3 and verse 19, the Bible says, the Bible says, John 3, 19. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. But men, what? They love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Notice that the Bible explains how condemnation comes to a person. You are not condemned when you simply find out that you're, you were doing something wrong. I think that's an important point to make right here. Because there might be some people in this room that says, man, I have been eating meat with the blood in it. And now I'm learning it's a sin and this, that, and the other. Oh, Lord, I'm doomed. I'm going to hell. No. Mm-mm-mm. Don't you send yourself to hell like that. God says, no, no, no. You need to understand how condemnation works. The way condemnation works is that when God shines light and he makes his truth clearly known and understood, and when we see the light, understand the light, but we say, but I love darkness more than I love that light, therefore I'm going to choose to hold on to my darkness. If we have an attitude like that, God says, now you're condemned. Now you're condemned. And that's serious. But if we can see the light and understand the light and say, Lord, I did not know this. By your grace, I repent. And it's going to be a new day. By your grace, help me to get on board and do what you say. You think God would condemn a soul like that? 
Oh no, brothers and sisters. God is not in the business of condemnation. God is in the business of education. And that's what we've been doing all week. We are educating. We are educating. That's what we're doing. So I don't want anybody in this room to start thinking to yourself, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm going to die. No, 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 no. Don't do that to yourself. What you have been is educated. And what you need to do is take the education, be solidified into it, that you can stand on it. And once it's solidified in your mind, then walk in the light as Christ is in that light. Amen? Amen. Well, somebody says, amen, Brother Lemon. Thank you so much for showing all these meat-eating people that they need to get off of their meat. Because I've been off of meat for years, Brother Lemon, so I'm doing all right. You know, sometimes people have that kind of attitude. But you know what problems some vegetarians and vegans have? Some of them have problems not so much with what food, but the amounts of food. <laughs> you know, it's funny, um... When a cow is a totally plant-based cow, did you know that there's no such thing as a fat cow? There's no such thing as an obese cow if he's eating only what he's supposed to be eating. In other words, sometimes we can gloat over the fact that we don't eat meat. But yet there can be manifestations in our physiology, whether it's obesity, which is a disease, hypertensive, and a lot of these other problems, and many a times, these things are happening directly associated to our dietary practices. But with vegans, or health reformers, as we call it, or whole food plant-based diet. In other words, something's wrong. Something's wrong somewhere. So therefore, God has a message even for those who eat the right articles of food. And one of the things we need to learn is that we need to eat the right amounts of food as well, even if it's healthy. Think about it this way. One day, Moses was called to go to uh, Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And when Moses did it, Pharaoh gave a response that I thought was very interesting. The Bible says, and afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Pretty arrogant statement, wouldn't you agree? Pretty arrogant statement. Now, the question may arise, well, what is, what is one of the reasons why Pharaoh would challenge God to the point he says, who is the Lord that I should even obey his voice? And I want you to see one of the revelations that the Bible gives us on perhaps why he stated this. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it says, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full. And what would happen if Solomon got full? He would deny thee and say, who is the Lord? So notice that Solomon knew how to connect the overindulgence of food and how it actually can do something to the state of mind that God can be denied and literally we can question who he is. We're talking about amounts of food. He said, feed me with food what? Convenient for me. Did you catch that? Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full. Lest I be full. Watch this. Do you think bread is good? You know bread is good because Jesus equated himself not just to water, he equated himself to bread. He said, I am the bread of life. So you know Jesus is into bread. Jesus believes in bread. Bread is all right to eat. Amen? Amen. All right, you can put a little honey on your bread. Now, watch this. As beautiful and wonderful as bread is, go to the book of Ezekiel 16 and let me show you a revelation from Scripture. The Bible says in Ezekiel 16, you know, today we believe that we are living in the days of Sodom. We are seeing many things that happen in the days of Sodom, and we're seeing it happen in our society today. But I want you to see what the Bible says in Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. And I want you to consider the verse. It says in Ezekiel 16, and let's read it slowly. You'll see in Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, we know that Sodom suffered a very terrible fate of which it was burnt up by God with fire and brimstone. Well, the Bible goes on to tell us in Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, it says, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. So whatever comes after that word Sodom is what the Bible calls iniquity. 
Now notice what it says. It says, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What's the first thing on the list? Pride. So does the Bible recognize pride as iniquity? Did you know that pride was one of the reasons why Sodom was destroyed? But notice, what's the next thing on the list? Fullness of bread. Notice it did not say eating bread. The problem was not that they ate bread because bread is good. But the problem was is that they ate a healthy product, but they ate too much of it. And as a result of being full on this healthy product, it affected them to the point that eventually it contributed to why God had to make an irreversible judgment. God hates gluttony. Even if you're overeating tofu, God hates gluttony. God hates gluttony. God hates overeating. God hates when individuals are controlled by appetite so much that remember what the Bible says. You see, this is a picture of gluttony. You've seen that picture before, some of you. Well, notice this. Remember what God says? He says, put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. In other words, if your appetite controls you, God says it would be better for you to be dead than alive. Why? Because when we indulge in appetite, it can cause us to reject God. I always thought it interesting when Nebuchadnezzar brings the children of Israel and Judah into captivity in Daniel 1, Nebuchadnezzar literally says, Daniel, I'm going to change your education. You read that in Daniel 1 and verse 4. He had to learn the tongue of the Chaldeans and the learning of the Chaldeans. Literally, Nebuchadnezzar introduced false education to Daniel. And Daniel gave no open protest. No open protest. Literally, Daniel, you know, he, he, he accepted the false education. Why? Because he was already rooted in true education. Then Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to change your name too. Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to change your name. Now you're going to be Belteshazzar. So here it is, or Belshazzar. And here it is that Daniel, you don't see any protests anywhere in the Bible. Why? Because Daniel says, listen, when you call me Belshazzar, yeah, I'll answer you. But he says, but when I speak, Daniel 7, he says, I, Daniel. Daniel 8, I, Daniel. Daniel 9, me, Daniel. So Daniel's like, look, I know my name. You can call me what you want, but I know my name. So False education, no open protest. Change the name, no open protest. But when Nebuchadnezzar said, change your diet, for the first time, Daniel says, I can't keep silent on this one. And he made an open protest. Why did Daniel do that, saints? Daniel understood what Solomon understood. He understood what David understood. He understood what Jesus understood. They understood that diet has a direct effect on the condition of the mind. And as a result of that, they had to resist. Now we have medical science that speaks to these points. In medical science, it states, a new study published online March 28th in Nature Neuroscience describes these rats' indulgent tribulations, adding to research literature on how excess food intake can trigger changes in the brain. So literally, excess food intake, it does not matter. It does not matter if it is tofu or if it is beef. While one may definitely hurt more than the other, but they both hurt and challenge and cause changes in the brain. It's called dopamine disorders. Now, notice this. The functions of dopamine, its cognition and frontal cortex. In the frontal lobes, dopamine controls the flow of information from other areas of the brain. That's why God cares so much about taking care of that frontal lobe. Because it literally, the dopamine that is excreted, it literally controls the flow of information that's going to travel and make us aware of what's going on, and then we are empowered to choose good and refuse evil. So therefore, it states, dopamine disorders in this region of the brain can cause a decline in neurocognitive functions, especially memory, attention, and problem solving. Now, I don't care if you're from India from Africa, from Europe, or from America. If you are male or female, or young or old, if there's one thing everybody in this room has, is problems. And every problem needs to be solved. 
And when dopamine plays a role connected to our frontal lobe of helping us problem solve, you don't want to do anything that's going to cause a disorder. Do you understand? So this is the reason why we have to be exceptionally mindful, not just what we eat, but even how much we eat. Now, consider this. I think we're going to find out one of the reasons why God allowed man to consume flesh. You see, the ten generations before the flood, before the flood, uh, when things were better, and the imaginations of men were not wicked continually all the time, you will notice that individuals lived very long. Adam lived to 930, Seth was 912, Enos was 905, Canaan was 910, Mahalaleel was 895, Jared was 962, Enoch was translated, Methuselah was 969, Lamech is 777, and Noah was 950 years old. So the average lifespan was literally like 912 years. This is before man started to consume flesh. Once God permitted man to consume flesh, notice one of the immediate things the Bible records. Ten generations after the flood, now consuming flesh. It noticed Shem, 600 years. Arphaxad, 438. Selah, 433. Eber, 464. Peleg, 239. Seru, 230. Nahor, 148. Terah, 205. And Abraham, 175 years. The average lifespan dropped to 317 years. If you want to understand why did God allow man to consume flesh, it was to shorten his lifespan. And we see that through the revelation of Scripture, watching the generations. Meat, brothers and sisters, flesh, it is not something that we have to partake of for health, life, strength, vitality, longevity, or any of these things. In fact, it does very much the opposite. It steals our health. It steals our vitality. It takes away our longevity. It takes away our health. So this is the reason why God says, I want you to learn how to eat. I want you to learn how to drink. I want you to learn how to do all these things that it can help reflect my characteristics, strength, life, peace. These are the things you want to be putting in your system. So, eating and drinking principles that produce life. What are the eating and drinking principles? Number one, understand that Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1, it says there's a time for everything under the sun. That means there's a time for eating, isn't there? There's a time to eat and not to eat. There's a time to eat and not to eat. Like I told you, the average meal complex carbohydrates. You need that. Every meal, when you're putting life in your system, should have four key components. Good fats, vitamins and minerals, and your good fats are primarily going to come from your nuts. Vitamins and minerals, that's your, basically your fruits and your vegetables. Then your proteins, what we're going to call them plant-based proteins. So this is where you can get into your soy, your soy-type products. And then your complex carbohydrates, which is your whole grains. So when you think about foods that produce life, you're thinking about good fats, which can come from your nuts. You're thinking about proteins, which can come from either things like your soybeans or it can come basically from your legume family, your bean family. Complex carbohydrates, that's your whole grains. That's your breads, your cereals, your pastas, your rice. And then your vitamins and your minerals all of your fruits, and all of your vegetables. The only thing that I would add to that is make sure that you're watching out for this GMO situation that's going on. As much as possible, make sure you're eating non-GMO fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. Because Satan is playing the game of life right now for all of us. So we have to be very diligent. Do the best you can in that area. These are the things that help produce life in us. We studied the amounts to eat, a quality of food. Ecclesiastes 10, 17 simply says, eat for strength and not for drunkenness. So whatever you're putting in your system, make sure it's going to strengthen your body. It means that, yes, you're going to have to learn how to become a label reader. It means you're going to have to probably add maybe an extra five or ten minutes in your grocery shopping because you're not just going to dump stuff in your cart anymore. Now you're going to look at it and you're going to say, hey, wait a minute, does this put life in me? Is this going to strengthen my body? You're going to need to familiarize yourself with certain ingredients and things so that way you can understand because, ladies and gentlemen, you got to understand, your brain is like hardware and your mind is like software. And you got to understand, I don't care how good your software is, if your hard drive is damaged, your software will produce nothing. 
So when you eat food, you got to think about things that's going to effectively feed those brain nerves. You got to think about that. When you drink, you got to think about things that's going to take good care of those brain nerves because there's a connection between diet and the mind. And we have to understand that food gets broken down to blood. The blood is what produces the health of our brain. Our brain is where we house our thoughts. Our thoughts is what produces our actions. Our actions repeated is what forms a habit. Our habits is what forms character, and our characters determine our destiny. And this is the connection that God has always wanted us to understand, and he wants us to impart this to a dying world, a world that's in sin. You know, the Bible tells us exactly what sin is. We looked at sin on opening night, and we talked about 1 John 3, 4, because remember, the reason why disease comes is because of violation of what? Spiritual and physical law. Remember that? That's how disease comes. So therefore, we looked at God's law, and we saw that the Bible says sin is the breaking of God's law. 1 John 3, 4. So what does God really want to do? He wants us to live a life that's in harmony with his law. And that's why we said we need medical missionaries. People who address the physical, the mental, and the spiritual to bring people's lives in harmony with God's law. But here's the question. How do you serve God's law? How do you serve it? How do you obey God's law? Do you want to know how you do it? Did we learn tonight that there's a connection between diet and the mind? Did we learn that? Yes, it is. Did you know, do you believe that God wants our lives to be in harmony with his law? Do you believe that? You better believe it. And the question is, well, then how do we serve the law of God? And you'd be amazed to know. Did you know that the Bible says in Romans 7 and verse 25, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. You see, you can't keep God's law when you and I indulge in perverted appetite. Do you understand the connection? You cannot serve God's law if we indulge in perverted appetite. And this is why we know how to say thou shalt not commit adultery, but we somehow find ourselves committing adultery with lusting in the eyes. We have no control over ourselves. We could say thou shalt not steal, but then we always find ourselves stealing someone's affection through this wicked thing called flirting. We can't really understand the depth of God's law while we're still indulging in perverted appetite. And God understands that, and that's why he's trying to help us understand diet and the mind. I'm letting you know right now, I'm going to let you in on a secret, ladies and gentlemen, a secret I learned many years ago. Did you know that health reform is really not all about healthy lungs, healthy heart, and healthy brain? Do you really want to know what the chief principle of health reform is all about? It's about being holy as God is holy. It is when we understand health reform on this platform that we'll take it a lot more seriously. Because I can ask many of us in this room right now, how often do we compromise on our health? How often do we cheat? How often do we do things that we already know is wrong, but we don't care? We're just going to do it anyhow. One of the reasons why is because all we think sometimes is it just helps my get, help myself get healthy lungs, healthy heart, healthy brain. But we have to understand health reform is about putting the mind in such a condition that when heaven downloads its truth to our minds, we can hear it. We can understand it, and we can apply it and faithfully share it with those we come in contact with and be a people prepared to meet our God. That is the reason for health reform. Everything else is icing on the cake. And therefore, my hope and my prayer is that we've understood some great principles tonight about diet and the mind. And that my hope and my prayer is, and I'm going to make a very important appeal right now. If you know, listen, I've been cheating. I, I have not... I have been cheating. I have not been faithful. There are many things that I've understood. There are many things that I've understood and I've known and I've taken for granted many of these truths. But tonight I'm making a brand new covenant with God, a brand new covenant that I'm going to let not my will, but I'm going to let his will be done. And I'm going to follow him and I'm going to follow his program to make sure that I now understand there's more at stake when it comes to my eating and my drinking. 
And I want my life to be in harmony with God's will. And if there's anybody in this room that says, you know what, that's me. I'm making a covenant with God. Yes, I've been slipping. I've been cheating. I've been making my mistakes. But by the grace of God, beginning tonight, I make a brand new covenant with the Lord. If that's you, would you stand to your feet with me? You're making a brand new covenant with God. You know where you've been cheating. You know where you've been messing up. You know where you've been slipping. And tonight you're saying that's it. New covenant. New covenant. New covenant. You'll be amazed at how the Lord is going to bless in your life. And as you take this seriously, and I solicit your prayers, saints, listen, overcoming appetite is the next hardest battle to overcoming sin. This is not easy. It cannot be done by might or by power. It's only going to be done by God's spirit. You literally have to pray and plead for the outpouring of God's spirit to help you and enable you to be faithful, even in that which is least, that you may be faithful in much. And God assures you, all that awaits you is a healthier, happier, and thank God, holier life. That's all, that's all we're holding back when we continue to indulge. We're losing out on a healthier, happier, holier life. Why in the world would we want to hold back on that any further? So make a covenant with the Lord in your heart. Make a real covenant with him. And understand that God keeps record of covenants. He keeps records. He's the master of it. So don't stand up just to respond to an appeal. Be serious about your commitment. And open your heart and receive the blessings that shall come. Amen? Why don't we go ahead and seal it with a word of prayer. Loving Father, we are grateful for the way that you have spoken to our hearts tonight. And you have helped us to see that there is truly a connection between diet and the mind. And it's our desire that our lives will be in harmony with yours. And that it will no longer be our will, but your will that shall be done. And may you show us how to get victory over our depression, our bipolar, and so many other things that are afflictions of the mind. And I pray, dear God, that we may realize that when the mind is submitted to Christ and when we put our minds first, last, and best and put you there, Lord, we are the happiest, the healthiest, and by your grace, we can even be a holy people. And I thank you that though these things may seem impossible with man, we're grateful all things are possible with God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated as we go through our closing phases of our service.